Good afternoon. Thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Shaw and Associates in our Get First Sighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR or Federal Acquisition Regulations is the rulebook that the federal government must follow when making purchases. A webinar series pulls from contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We will post all of these recordings on our website and YouTube channel, where we have over 300 government contracted webinars available for download. A special thanks to our webinar partner in the series, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We would also take, like to thank our friends at Open the Fire for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jenniferschaus.com. And now a little bit about us. We work primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work for product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include public and charity organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. Now we would like to let you know about some ways to reach government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jenniferschaus.com. Also, please join us on Tuesday, June 23rd for our virtual Hot Topics and GovCon virtual conference. This is a remote conference. Please use the link you see on the screen to register. You can also visit the event section on our website to register. During this conference, we will take your live questions and the PowerPoint will be on, and webinar will only be available to those who register for the conference. We really hope to see you there. Now let's move on to learn a bit about today's speaker, David Dempsey. You can find his contact information on the screen here. And today we are covering FAR Part 25 with David. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really thankful for your participation in the series. The floor is now yours. Let me know when you're ready for your next slide. Okay, I'll start now. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm David Dempsey. I've been doing federal procurement for 42 years and I uh, was fortunate, I guess, to, to get this topic because uh, a lot of the phrases, phraseology and names and such were uh, ones that uh, me and a group I was with in 1980, 1979 and 80, uh, came up with while we were uh, putting together the implementation for the Defense Department on the uh, NATO MOUs and the <clears throat> 1979 Trade Agreements Act. So let's, uh, if we could go to the first slide here, then. and you'll see that since it's on foreign acquisitions, I'm going to start with a Buy American. And that's a statutory site for, for those familiar with, uh, <clears throat> with the Buy American Act, you'll notice that that's a completely different site. It used to be 41 USC 10 A through B, and now it's this one. And we have three executive orders from the Trump administration. Got them listed there. I'm confident you all have at least heard of them. And so far, there's only one guidance memo out, and that's by the Department of Commerce. And that was for the Buy American and Hire American executive order, and that guidance came out uh, June 30, uh, 2017. The reason I bring that up is because there is no guidance from the FAR Council on any of this. And this is a little disappointing uh, because not only is there no FAR Council implementation, it's uh, none of these executive orders are even on their uh, uh, semi-annual uh, list of uh, cases or whatever. So that's a little disappointing. And that disappointment by uh, sheer coincidence came up again today because the FAR Council is planning to implement a, a series of, of regulations dealing with small business that took small business uh, about a year and a half or two years just to get off the drawing board, so to speak. And uh, that's the justification and approval for 8A contracts. It's, it's gone from $20 million threshold to $100 million threshold. So that's a, that's a huge difference, of course. But, and the point is not to talk about the 8A justification, excuse me, the 8A threshold. It's just to say that these uh, policy things that are clearly 
fairly important to the uh, entire procurement world are, are taking a long time to get out. So at this stage, all you know is that the SBA has implemented this and now the, the DFAR uh, system is going to do it and we haven't gotten real far on, on the other one, but it's, it is what it is and, and, and that's what we're doing. So I just bring that to your attention that you should uh, try to check the regulations as much as possible. And the easiest way to do that is to go to wifcon.com, which is W-I-F-C-O-N.com. And uh, you can explore their, their website and that sort of thing. But on the left-hand side, they always have the, uh, the new regulations uh, coming out. On the Buy American side, they, uh, the, the uh, FAR Council issued the list of items in the Buy American Act regulations. This is the FAR uh, Part 25, where they have a series of items, quite a few actually, where they're saying uh, these are the items that uh, are not available as far as the list goes. And this is the things that are obscure as uh, Cobra venom to uh, various various metals like nickel. And they've simply asked, because uh, they, they do this every five years, they simply ask people to comment on whether or not a given item is now available or if they know of any other item that should be on that list. Uh, not that anyone on this particular call would be curious about that, but the point again being that these regs uh, change a lot um, and then in the, in the DFAR, the uh, um, continued uh, elevation of UK and Australia in, in, the, in the export control world is, is, is coming uh, to light because there they put in some uh, new regs out, uh, corrections in, in the DOD's mind that everyone should know that the UK and Australia are part of the defense industrial base. So it's now the US, Canada, and UK, and Australia. Okay. Now, now we'll go on to the Buy American Act. Uh, I'm confident that a lot of people are familiar with this already. So I'm trying to, uh, to get through this first couple of slides uh, as uh, <clears throat> easily as possible. Now, the Buy American Act is a preference. It's always been a preference, never been a restriction. And it has to do with supply items and construction materials that are going to be used in the United States. And that's the, that's the <clears throat> discriminator there is produced and used in the United States. And the formula for the Buy American Act is, is uh, straightforward. Obviously, the first test is the two-part test, is the item has to be made in the U.S., produced in the U.S. And then the cost of components of that item, 50% <clears throat> made in the U.S. Uh, and that's different, of course, from the substantial transformation test we'll be getting in a few minutes with the Trade Agreements Act. The, the point is essentially take uh, uh, a list of your components, to a given item, construction material or not, and then uh, add them up. And that includes the, uh, the, the cost of uh, transportation, duty if it if it's, uh, <clears throat> has not been waived. And, and then if those materials from the, from the US or non-US hit that 50% range, you will know if you qualify as a, a domestic uh, end product. And domestic end product is a different term in the Buy American world than <clears throat> U.S. end product, which is a term that came in from the Trade Agreements Act in a specific, specific uh, legal case in that. So what I've got there is after that explanation, there are the clauses that uh, implement that. And you see some of the uh, <clears throat> caveats. Uh, first, if uh, if a component is a TOTS product, then there's no component test. You don't do the 50% uh, issue. And then at the bottom there, we're talking about place of manufacture, another FAR clause. 
And all that's emphasized there is the item has to be made in the U.S. out of components or from raw materials process into the finished products. But, but then disassembly and reassembly is not does not constitute uh, production or manufacturing. That uh, particular issue has been the subject of uh, several GAO cases over the past uh, 25 or 30 years. I checked before we got on this thing, and there's, there's no new case uh, that that is uh, worth worth talking about. Uh, that's probably the best way to sum it up, because all, all they do is talk about the cases, excuse me, refer to the cases that have been decided over the years. And then with respect to uh, the evaluated price, this is what the Buy American Act does. It says by uh, an executive order that, you, that in order to identify whether or not the Buy American Act is going to apply, you have to have price reasonableness because that's one of the, the exceptions. The formula right now is if the competitor is a large business, then the foreign company's offer will have 50% added to it plus duty and that price will be what it is and then if it's competing against a small business the foreign competitor has their price increased by 12% uh, and then it says uh, plus duty as a practical matter, that is used for evaluation, but it's not. It's not used for what the government ultimately pays, because uh, most most agencies will, will get a waiver of duty. Uh, anyway, the the uh, point you want to focus on is that's what the Buy American does. It's a preference, and if a foreign offeror comes in at the at, you know greater than six percent or greater than twelve percent less, then the uh, contracting officer is going to be uh, authorized to make an award to that foreign offer. So the point from uh, your perspective is that uh, you should know this as well as you should know your competition. And when uh, price is a serious element in the uh, award decision, then you want to be able to <clears throat> factor that into, into your offer price. And then as a, as a practical matter, keep in mind that this is for uh, Buy American Act, essentially for price requirements, uh, not complete evaluation. So if you're within a, if you're doing an RFP here that is going to go with best value, then uh, regardless of what of what the price weighting is in the in the uh, section M of that particular RFP. Uh, the decision on whether technical or management or something is more important than price is going to eliminate the practical application of uh, the My American Act. And then I, to help, you have a quick reference, uh, FAR 25.002, as a what I call an applicability chart, and that uh, has items at the top, and then it'll tell you what what clause is going to apply and that sort of thing. And then at the end, in 25 point, uh, FAR 25.1101, there's a directions, which to the contracting officer, which you can look at and you'll get an idea if, if you know your competition well enough, um, either US using a lot of foreign components or a foreign source, you'll have an idea what clauses you have to, to look out for. So in order to, I'm going to the next slide now, in, in order to stress how, um, I'm trying to think of a kind word, I guess I'll go ahead and just say how worthless the Buy American Act is now. Uh, it's easiest thing to do is compare it to uh, the DFA, uh, the Defense Department. You can see these are some uh, remarkable uh, distinctions uh, between these. Uh, two regulatory schemes. And down at the bottom, I've gone through some of the major buying agencies, uh, the ones with the uh, with the most money, essentially. And you see under 
under the uh, HSAR or the Homeland Security Acquisition Reg, they have one clause in the Part 25. And that clause deals with the Homeland Security's uh, Barry Amendment. If you're familiar with that. That is a uh, well known restriction on the Defense Department for purchase of clothing it has to be produced in the U.S. as well as the components as well as the material that sort of thing and Homeland Security has their own little Barry Amendment which pretty much just goes to, to uniforms. Uh, when we go to the Department of State's acquisition regs they have two clauses under their part 25 and they both deal with the uh, Arab boycott of Israel and obviously they say you can't do that um, or can't participate in that boycott and then go to the NASA bar supplement and those two clauses deal with export licenses uh, and it, it's nice to see that there's going to be more and more agencies going to be doing that uh, for various reasons mostly because of uh, section uh, 889 of the 2019 uh, NDAA or National Defense Authorization Act which uh, says you can't purchase much from China anymore. Uh, on, a, on another uh, lecture I give on on uh, the defense industrial race or the supply chain, I, I go into detail about that, but that's uh, essentially, if anybody wants to know about that, just send me an email later and I can send you the site. Uh, but that is government-wide, it's not just Defense Department. And they have been implemented in another part of the FAR, which is uh, uh, part four, where the CCC, MMC, and, and the various uh, cybersecurity regs appear. Uh, the trend in cybersecurity has gone from being from cyber hygiene to a focus on the supply chain, and government has picked up on that. And then with respect to the DEERS or the Department of Energy uh, FAR supplement, they've got a particular, particularly obscure Buy American type clause associated with uh, an, an element of, of nuclear fuel. And, and then the other one is, is another export. And then the GSA, the Veterans Administration and uh, Department of Transportation, they don't have anything in part 25, but they're gonna have other things throughout, which is principally gonna be the, the uh, <clears throat> section 889 on the Chinese restrictions, as I summarize it. And over time, they're gonna, they're gonna be having uh, some more elements, that, that much, not, not against the Chinese, I think, so much as export license uh, requirements. Uh, and I, I realized that you're thinking, well, I'm not exporting anything, uh, that may be, but the people that you're buying from may be, your vendors may be exporting and they may be importing and, and you've got to, you're going to have to take uh, some attention, have to pay some attention with respect to your uh, supply chain. So in the next uh, slide, as I mentioned, I'm getting into the Trade Agreements Act here. And this is, uh, I'm not sure, Do go to the next slide, please. And Trade Agreements Act, uh, first thing is it uh, supersedes the Buy American Act. And, and essentially that statutory authority, which we have there, uh, indicates very clearly that, that the <clears throat> government is uh, going to be going by the Trade Agreements Act most of the time rather than the Buy American and the implementation of that Trade Agreements Act uh, has brought some complexity to sourcing from uh, non-U.S. companies, or, or, or I should put it, companies not located in the U.S. Because uh, the, the Buy American Act and the Trade Agreements Act go to location, not ownership, if you will, of a, of a, of a company in the U.S., unless, of course, it's a... Uh, company owned by uh, the mullahs in Iran or the Chinese or some other embargoed country, that sort of thing. That we don't have to worry about. 
uh, today. But what we've got here is a prohibition. Note the difference now, the prohibition is not a preference. Contracting officers cannot purchase items from non-signatory countries to the World Trade Organization government procurement agreement or a country or a source uh, that is a non-signatory to a free trade agreement. Uh, as you see here in the definitions, uh, we've got a, a lot of countries. In fact, it's pretty hard not to be one of these countries. And there are a few, China being the principal one, because it has not signed a government procurement agreement. It has signed the World Trade Organization's overall agreement, but not that element of the uh, GPA. So we have Korean Basin country because they have a series of free trade agreements. And these are designated countries uh, mentioned earlier. I was draft drafting these regs. Designated country was one of the uh, terms that came up with. Eligible product is one that you see later on on that list. And then a designated country end product that's obviously an end product from the uh, so-called designated country, which is going to be an entire uh, panoply of countries from Caribbean Basin or have their own uh, free trade agreement with the U.S. or they have signed the WTO's uh, government procurement agreement. And then we have this term called a U.S. made end product. And that to me is a uh, came about from a decision by a, a Judge Henley, who used to work with back in the old days at the Defense Logistics Agency. And he was a judge at the then GSBCA board or the General Services Board of Contract Appeals. And he noticed in the regulations in, in the, in the uh, <clears throat> In writing his decision that it appeared that the U.S. was not a designated country or the regulations had not made any sense or inclusion of a U.S. made end product. And the reason that's relevant is when we get to the substantial transformation test. So he essentially said in his decision, this is really uh, kind of dumb. And uh, he said he wasn't going to interpret the uh, <clears throat> Bar Council's interpretation of the, Bi of the Trade Agreements Act for purposes of saying that everybody in the world could have substantial transformation, but the U.S. could not. So that's where we get the term U.S. made end product. And then there's other terms, and they're all in the definitional section. Uh, the main thing about the Trade Agreements Act is that the end product has to be substantially transformed in the designated country or the eligible country, whatever you want to put it, but it's, it's got to be in a country where one of these agreements is in effect, either a one-on-one -on -one free trade agreement with the U.S. or as a member of the <clears throat> World Trade Organization's of government procurement agreement. Now, substantial transformation means what I've brought there in the quote. And this uh, comes from the clause, but the, the genesis of this is from the uh, customs service as they were trying to figure out for purposes of the uh, uh, terror schedule, whether or not something was substantially transformed in a given country so as to be the place of origin. And if it was a place, if it was a place of origin, then it would fit in one element of the terror schedule and presumably have a higher or lower duty to pay to get into the U.S. than another uh, country who, for whatever reason, did not have uh, the same uh, level of uh, favor with the U.S or that the item itself didn't matter. It didn't matter if it was made in one country or another country, but where it was made, it was, it was not going to get the tariff schedule treatment that that importer would, would like. So what we have in the two statutes we've talked about so far is the Trade Agreements Act has a substantial transformation test and the 
Buy American Act has a cost has a cost of components test, and they both, of course, have the uh, requirement that it be made either in the U.S. or in a designated country. Uh, what th what this means is that you can uh, bring in components uh, from all the designated countries in the world and put together the product in the U.S. and you'll you'll have one or two things. You'll you'll have a an end product made in a designated country, but more than likely you're going to have a U.S. made end product. So for purposes of your um, again, supply chain and for purposes of your uh, cost uh, prices that you're going to charge, et cetera, et cetera, you're going to uh, have to know whether or not you can take an item from a foreign country, make it into a product that has a uh, name, character, or use distinct from that of the article or articles from which it was transformed, and then sell it to the US government, or since this is a flow down clause, sell it to someone higher up in your um, <clears throat> customer base or a higher tier subcontractor. Once you have that sorted out, then the government has to figure out what the eligibility is of these designated country end products. And Every two years, the uh, USTR, US Trade Reps Office, will issue a dollar figure for the <clears throat> application of the Trade Agreements Act. And there's, there's uh, basically no exceptions with respect to the eligibility, that is you have the dollar threshold and you have to make, make sure there's no exceptions in the US implementation. And the US government or USG as I got there has accepted on a product groups basis with the Defense Department, an entire series of items, which I'll uh, get to at the very end here. So I wanna mention now, because this is on the FAR, not, not the DFAR, and the, List is where this DFAR is. That's why I have that site there. Small business set asides are not the subject of the Trade Agreement Act. So that's by American only. If there's a small business set aside, those small businesses, when they're providing a product, have to make sure, or construction material, that sort of thing, have to make sure that it's a US uh, product, a US construction material. Uh, there's some statutory restrictions which we'll, we'll get into uh, that are in the FAR, and, and I've mentioned one with respect to, to the supply chain for Huawei. Uh, can't have that. But at any rate, those are going to be the second half of the eligibility requirement for the application of the Trade Agreements Act. So I'll continue with the Trade Agreements Act in the next slide. And here we have the dollar thresholds. And it's at 182,000 right now for a supply item. I checked that last night. It's still at 182,000. And what this means is, is a GPA signatory, a country in that, uh, excuse me, a company in that country uh, cannot submit an eligible offer if the procurement is for 182,000 or less. It has to be over that threshold to make that GPA signatory eligible to offer. And the 182,000 is a dollar figure that is in the, in the FAR, but in terms of the contract and officer's decision, that contract and officer makes a determination on the applicability essentially the applicability of the Trade Agreements Act by taking the estimated uh, pricing that the CEO thinks they're going to receive when they send out uh, these offers, excuse me, these uh, solicitations. And that estimated, the, the, re the way you reach an estimated price is by 
as a practical matter, adding in cost of the options, and that comes from another part of the FAR, which is in uh, part one. It's a it's uh, basically called a a, a uh, FAR um, construct that is is used. So when you're figuring out the dollar thresholds of the Trade Agreements Act, or you're trying to figure out the applicability of the Truth and Negotiations Act. When you get to those thresholds for the Truth and Negotiations Act, the threshold is going to be 750,000 now, and that's that threshold is identified uh, whether or not you whether or not the solicitation is going to go over that or not. It's a function of the uh, the estimated cost, including the options, uh, in order to figure out whether a dollar threshold is uh, going to be relevant and then as a practical matter i don't remember the site right there the day right now but within the last month the a lot of thresholds have changed because they change every every five years anyway looking at australia australia is a free trade agreement Act country and it can source from australia can submit an offer when the threshold exceeds $83,099, Canada, $25,000, Korea, $100,000. And we have the, I put these other uh, countries, uh, Morocco, Oman, Peru, and Panama, they all have free trade agreements, but their dollar threshold is the same as uh, GPA's dollar threshold. Now, the Trade Agreements Act also includes services. So, you know, supplies and uh, construction. The construction figure is uh, a little over, excuse me, just under $8 million. Well, and that threshold has to be reached before a uh, GPA or FTA country is gonna be eligible to submit an offer. The services, they have more, uh, th this is a list of what is not gonna be submit, so subjected to the Trade Agreement Act. So right now, any any overseas military support services is going to not have the Trade Agreements Act apply to. Now, other elements of the, of the FAR, well, where contracting officer can make determinations, et cetera, to get out of the well, he's already out of the of the Trade Agreements Act, and now we're trying to figure out whether or not an appropriation restriction is involved or whether the Buy American Act is going to apply. And the Buy American Act, of course, as mentioned earlier, applies to items that are used in the in the uh, US. So it looks like that military support service for services would sort of be out, but then we understand, of course, that Buy American only applies to construction materials and supply items, not services there's another element of, of the far where officer uh, can essentially get the procurement that they want done completed by a local source and that by the way could be an element of a uh, statute or another international agreement like the status of forces agreement you think about the military bases in germany for example uh, then they can use that to get away from the buy american Act. but the far part 25 is the baseline uh, for this analysis and that's what we're talking about uh, today and all these other items that uh, you know just are come right out of that table that's i've cited here 25.401B, and there's a table there. Uh, the last one of uh, management and operation contracts of a uh, U.S. of a, of a U.S. facilities or U.S. dedicated facilities, and I have the example there: federally funded research and development uh, centers. They can be anywhere in the world, and right now, under the FAR, they're out of the Trade Agreements Act. And because it's a service, they're not going to be subject. They're not going to be subjected to the Buy American. So let me go to the next slide. 
and we're still in a trade agreements act and the reason we're in the trade agreements act uh, in, in, in my mind is because that's the most uh, significant part of uh, the far with respect to contract and officer requirements that he or she needs to go through when putting together their solicitation uh, i mentioned uh, later on and we may not we may not get to it that's why i want to mention it now is is that the far has a section at the at the end of part 25 where they give some pretty careful directions and as you can see that's down at the bottom of this slide bar 25.1101 a through d and they that that section does a lot of work for the contract and officer to get the right clauses in the contract okay. so now what uh, we go through is some peculiarities with the trade agreements act if it's going to be applicable we've got the dollar threshold there's no exclusion and now uh, one or more items that uh, is going to be <clears throat> excuse me going to be solicited is going to be subject to a couple of other elements uh, in the FAR. The first one is administrative, the notice requirements. Uh, the next one is the uh, one associated with receipt of offers. That is, under the FAR, a Trade Agreements Act item is supposed to have at least 40 days. The thinking there being that since they're overseas, they may need a few more days rather than the standard 30 to go ahead and, and provide the um, offer. And then, of course, the same section gives the contracting officer an ability to go to 10 days if necessary. Uh, this is, I, I should, I think it's rarely used. I only say that I see it very often. And I, I, I see a lot of RFPs. Um, so most of them will just do the 40 days and, and that'll be that. And now we go to evaluate the offer coming from a foreign source under the trade agreement set. First thing we say is uh, CO can rely on a certification. Uh, the only time they can't rely on that certification is if they get information from obviously normally a competitor who says, I think this person is bringing in stuff from uh, North Korea, China, uh, the Philippines, other parts of, uh, of, of Asia, South America, et cetera, who have not signed up to the World Trade Agreement, World Trade Organization, GPA, or they don't have their own uh, free trade agreement with the US. And then we, we use the, the evaluated price and the best value decision. Now, this particular provision has, this, has the effect, just like, it, just like I mentioned in the Buy American Act, of a best value procurement essentially guts the Trade Agreement Act and the Buy American Act because the relevance of price is normally in, in the best value decision, but not the predominant element of source selection. Obviously, um, sections L and M are always gonna say is things are better closer technically and price becomes more important. Okay, fine, at that point, the uh, contracting officer can go through the <clears throat> Uh, price for purposes of the best value decision, but as long as technical or past performance in particular, as long as those count more than price in the award decision, then these uh, foreign source provisions in Part 25 and in the DFAR also and all the other agencies is going to have less impact on a contract officer's award decision and therefore on your uh, proposal strategy. Okay. Now, we're also talking about the uh, 
substantial transformation test, and you're going to have to be able to defend that, or your source is going to have to be able to defend that substantial transformation. Uh, and the best way to do that is you go to the U.S. Customs Service website, and they've got a whole website on customs decisions. You put in the search term substantial transformation, and then you will get a couple of hundred decisions uh, to look at and you'll find out what the custom service says on whether or not something was substantially transformed at the um, stated country of origin for that item. So what, what the custom service calls country of origin, for our purposes, we're going to call it designated country location. Um, same effect, and GAO has cases that say uh, when uh, <clears throat> when in doubt, we go to the, uh, the custom service, and it's still called custom service in in the uh, in the website. Uh, now it'll be called uh, customs and border patrol. Okay, on the twenty five point excuse me point five oh four, there are a whole bunch of examples, uh, pages of, them, and you have to go through them, sort them out yourself, if you are going to use a foreign source or if you think one of your competitors is going to be using a, a foreign source then you want to go through all that for purposes of trying to figure out uh, whether or not you're going to be uh, well, i'm not protesting i don't I, you never know about that but uh, raising some issue with a contract officer that it's an improper uh, certification and they ought to look into it and now that is, fortunately, the gist of the uh, presentation. So I'm just going to go through part 25 and go to the next slide. And the, the next slide shows contracts performed outside the U.S. And that's the title of 25.3. And you go through this, and these are basically going to be contractor personnel going to an area a combat area or they're supporting a diplomatic or consular mission which is to say the same thing as a guard service and when they do that these are the things that the contracting officer has to keep in mind and if you are in one of those uh if, you, if you're if your company does that sort of thing then you want to go ahead and uh, look at these clauses to see uh, what is going to work out is you see down at the bottom under 25 FAR 25.302 on the uh, right hand side, the middle of the right hand side of the page, it says FAR 22.25225-26, and that incorporates 32 CFR titled Private Security Companies Operating in Contingency Operations, and there's a lot of data there that they uh, that the contractor has to be aware of because of the requirements that contractor is going to have uh, for purposes of, of <clears throat> being able to be in compliance with, with the clause of part 20, the dash 26 clause, which I've got there. Uh, and, and, and that's it. So I don't know how many people listening here or want to listen, they have outside have contracts where you're going to be performed outside the U.S., but you're going to have to look at the FAR, and you're certainly going to have to look at the DFAR, uh, because that is uh, what are more um, <clears throat> requirements. So now we go on to uh, the next section of the FAR uh, for this, and that's going to be the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And I haven't seen one of these contracts in quite a few quite a few years, so you'll just have to uh, look at that uh, by yourself and you get the gist of it, but it's not likely you're going to have a uh, procurement that's going to be funded by the uh, Recovery and Re Reinvest Reinvestment Act, because uh, those dollars, if they haven't, uh, all that $800 uh, million, $900 million, uh, none of that was, none of all of that was not spent. That much we know. Now, whether it returned to the Treasury under the various uh, uh, appropriation requirements or that the 
GAO and the uh, uh, Defense Financial Management Service does. Um, I don't know, but it's not likely you're going to see a FAR 25.6 solicitation. So now we'll just go on to the to the next slide, which is a requirement that you can't deal with Sudan and you can't deal with Iran. Now, it doesn't take much to figure out you can't deal with Iran. And 25.701 tells you all the things that you need to know. And that's uh, where the list of specifically designated nationals and blocked persons, which means it's not this is not import export. This is you can't not have transactions with them. So it's against the law to have a Cuban cigar, and it's against the law to have a Persian rug from Iran. Obviously, you can get around that because of the exceptions in the OPAC regs, and at least with respect to the rugs, uh, you can do that. But the, the point being that that list, as you see, I looked at it last night, and it's dated June 2nd, was a little over 1,400 pages. That, that is a hell of a list to look through. But if you think you're dealing with somebody, then you go to 25.7, get that website, go look at the list, and you just search for it. And then there's some uh, 25.8 is other international agreements and coordination. Now I look at this website here, I do a lot of overseas work all the time. Uh, it's essentially called the TIS list, and that's international agreements and treaties. Uh, treaties, I don't think you have to worry about too much because uh, they're very, they're, I shouldn't say they're straightforward, but they're, they're highlighted in TIAS. It's the international agreements that come up, and these are letters of exchange, that sort of thing, where something may be relevant uh, to your <clears throat> uh, offer that you're putting in because you're going to be operating in an XYZ country. And what it frequently does is uh, bring up something like uh, duties and taxes. But we'll put that aside now and go to the next slide because we're low on time. Uh, basically, the U.S. government doesn't pay doesn't pay duties. The FAR says if the duty is going to be over fifteen thousand, we ain't paying it. And the Defense Department says if you're delivering it to the U.S. to the U.S. Defense Department, whether it's an end product or phone or anything. We're not paying duty either, either. And the Defense Department has a specific exemption in the uh, harmonized tariff schedule, whereas the non-defense contracting officer has to go through some hoops. But for the purposes of uh, U.S. Um, companies using foreign components or end products, they want to be sure to notify the government under 225-8 so they can get started on the paperwork. And we have additional foreign acquisition regulations, and that's pretty straightforward. Uh, currency, you know, you got to have a reason. Contract officer has to have a reason not to use U.S. currency, and that mostly shows up in Afghanistan now. And then in uh, taxes, for your ability to have a, a quote unquote lower price, because normally taxes are, are part of it. You have to get an exemption from your foreign source that the uh, party is going to receive federal procurement payments because if they don't get, and this is the W-14, if they don't get that certificate and it should go in with your offer and with every invoice, then uh, you're going to have 2% withheld, at least the payment to your sub will, and you don't need that problem. And now we're going to the Defense Department. We're out of time, basically, since I frequently going on. So on the next slide, I have up at the top there the uh, Department of Defense. So if we get to that next slide real quick, then we will be uh, over and out here. And if we are on, are you, are you able to switch to the next slide? because the balance of payment program is a 50% evaluation factor to 
peculiar only to the Defense Department and it's peculiar to a narrow set of circumstances. I've tried to explain that the best I could on this slide. And the, in the DFARS, the uh, PGI has some examples on, on evaluation. And it's, it's essentially what happens when a US company is doing something overseas or wants to do something overseas with the Defense Department. And they're going to have competition, obviously, from local suppliers or construction companies. And the balance of payments program says as 50% to those foreign offers for price evaluation purposes. And then what is that, that program has been in effect since 1954, I think, or 56. And excuse me, the and the what's happened now is if you're if it's a qualifying country source, which is a NATO signatory, there's a lot of NATO nations now, not not the ones we grew up with, or a designated country offeror, then the balance of payments doesn't apply. So again, you have to do your do some uh, serious <clears throat> some uh, serious market analysis to see who your competition may be and wh whether or not you can ask the contracting officer to invoke that 50% price evaluation factor. And then on the last slide here with Defense Department, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, there are a bunch of products that were uh, identified in the DFAR. And if you go to 401 70, you're going to see those items. Um, and those are items that the Trade Agreements Act does apply to for the Defense Department. Uh, another element is off Afghanistan. There's still a lot of money being spent in Afghanistan. I mentioned earlier, DOD has a duty free exemption under the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the United States. And then DOD has any number of authorization act or appropriation act statutory restrictions and i've got some items listed there you know american flag got to be made in the u.s with and with u.s fabric especially the metals a lot of exemptions there the main one being nato countries for qualifying country sources supercomputers hand tools came from gsa roller bearing there's an old one and you can see some of your gear stuff indicating how successful some companies are at lobbying versus other. The, the last slide is pretty straightforward, I hope, and that is thank you for your attention. I appreciate you going through this uh, <clears throat> remarkably exciting <clears throat> presentation. If you have any questions, you've seen at the beginning, you can uh, uh, contact me. And uh, be, uh, be glad to work with you. And thank you very much. Uh, take care and have a good weekend. Thank you. All right. Thank you for a great presentation, David. To our audience members, we thank you again for participating with us. And if you have any questions about this part of the FAR, please contact our speaker with the contact information you see on the screen. Also, just a reminder again to join us on Tuesday, June 23rd for a virtual Hot Topics and Tipcon conference. Uh, this is a remote conference. Please use the link that you see on the screen to register, or you can also visit our website and check under the events section to register. And if you have any questions about federal contracting or need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes today's webinar. Yeah. Take care. See you later.